Greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson and I'm a forest gardener and forest garden designer and welcome to uh, protecting your backyard forest. This is the fifth, <laughs> is it the fourth? It's the fourth in a series of eight online lectures for uh, Create a Backyard Forest online course. This is a free preview of that course. The slideshow will always be available at this URL, forestgarden.wales forward slash course forward slash protection. And the, uh, the video for this will always be on YouTube as well. So even when I finally get round to publishing my course, uh, if you can't afford it or whatever, the material will always be online on, on YouTube. Uh, okay, and then course overview. So I think this is kind of handy just to kind of get it into perspective. And thanks again to Pam for, for, for the suggestions about the, the, the different stages and, and being kind of clear about this. What I've found is the first three parts of the course, the first three lectures are really about the, 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 the design and the planning side. And this is kind of observing, uh, make, make, documenting the observations, creating a wish list, thinking about the land, seeing what's there and then starting the design process. And then the next three, which is this is this is part of, this is the structural stuff. I think this is like the, the when you get the garden established, you want to get the wind breaks in and the, the structures, the kind of protective structures like uh, greenhouses and polytunnels and putting paths in. And then it's getting a productive perennial veg patch as well, getting that getting that going and then putting in the canopy uh, the canopy trees. So that's the kind of big kind of structural productive things that you do at the, can do at the beginning and then you can have a gap in between and what's so nice about this and about a forest garden is that you don't have to do it all at once so you can do all this have a, a, a an undercover if it's a grass if it's a field that you're starting from you can have a, you can keep the grass in place and then you can put the trees in put per, a perennial veg area in put your windbreaks in and you can leave it at that and just concentrate on the vegetables for a year and then just do part bit by bit. So the next stage after you've done that is to prepare the ground, is to re remove, for example, remove the grass and then plant the shrubs and the ground cover. But you can leave space between us. You don't have to do it all at the same time. So I think that's really um, important to, to note. Um, but obviously it depends upon your setup and your land. So today we're doing protection and what we will learn different types of protection uh, this is yeah as i said and originally this was going to be wind breaks but now we're also looking at uh, kind of water uh, protection from water and for water and uh, sun and, and and warmth and cold and also uh, predators as well a quick look at predators and then looking at windbreak design the kind of there's there's a few kind of key principles uh, for for designing a windbreak uh, how to establish a windbreak hedge, uh, the actual practical digging a, digging a hedge, how how yeah what tools to use etc. And then a quick look at some uh, suitable hedge hedge windbreak plants, uh, a, a half a dozen or so. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is like uh, Annie says in her book. Oh yes, I meant to mention the book again, didn't I? This is Annie Annie Kelsey. This is the the Garden of Equal Delights just just out a, a few days ago. Fantastic book about the principles behind forest gardening and about forest gardeners and your role in the garden and rethinking your role in the garden and emphasising the importance of wildlife in the garden. So absolutely brilliant book. The Garden of Equal Delights. I'm only on the first chapter and I've nodded my head on every single page. Um, so yeah, she talks about these different principles and they're all supporting, they're all like, they're, they're, they're all part of a whole. So by looking at like protection, it's not, you're separating something out and then looking at it and it's actually really difficult. It doesn't stand alone. Protection is related, related to all the other parts as well. So for example, you can have a, you can have a shrub that is doing multiple things. Uh, it can be a part of a windbreak hedge. It can be a nitrogen fixer. It can provide berries. It can provide habitat for wildlife. It can provide food for wildlife, berries for wildlife. It can provide leaf uh, materials for the larval stages of, of, of insects. It can do all these things. So it's not just a windbreak hedge. So 
yeah, it's it's kind of quite interesting. We're, we're almost taking things apart and then looking at them in isolation. But remember, do to join them back together. And the whole way, my way of looking at it is it's an edible ecosystem. We're creating an edible ecosystem with a variety of different habitats and a variety, a, a, a huge diversity of different plants. So, uh, yeah, and then always, always, I think there's kind of three principles that I look at and this is kind of gardening stuff as well it's always about accessibility being able to access the different parts of the garden attention and actually looking at what is going on and accessibility again is part of attention you need to have paths to an area if it's being developed as a forest garden so that you can see what is happening and I and again I think this is something I've overlooked and I'm kind of changing now my own garden um, but it's yeah it's the relationship between accessibility attention and then protection because you can't protect something if you don't know how it's going how it's getting on I'm fully aware I've got plants in a forest garden I've kind of ignored uh, but you just need to kind of like just observe and intervene when intervene at the necessary point so first off protection then and I've called this elemental <laughs> elemental protection um, the wind breaks protecting from the wind is one of the biggest things that you can do in a garden in uh, in, in, in any garden and this yeah this is like number one establish your wind breaks it's almost like do, do this before you do anything else because all the, the whole garden will benefit from protection uh, trees as the saying goes trees like the company of other trees plants appreciate the company of other plants plant it in isolation not as part of a, a as part of a polyculture as part of a, of a as a group of plants and it won't do so well um, and it's protection from the elements so it's protecting from wind and it's protecting from the cold and from frost and from excess water and not enough water but it's also and from protecting from predators but it's also protection for wildlife so you're protecting the plants but you're also protecting the wildlife, the ecosystem that you are establishing. So it's it's kind of both. You're protecting, like the picture here, you've got a, a blackbird. That hawthorn is giving it, it, it it's giving the, the the protection for the for the wildlife, a nesting habitat, and and a food source, as well as protecting the plants in a, in a forest in a forest garden. <clears throat> And your plants will grow, you know, they'll grow faster and they'll grow stronger if they have this protection. I might get rid of chat. I'm just going to put chat out of the way because I can see it out the corner of my eye. Uh, so, yeah, wind and frost damage to blossom. So, yeah, and it's a kind of combination. Very often it's a combination. You want to protect from the wind and you also want to protect from the wind and the cold. We've got a quite an exposed site here on the southeast facing um, hill in, in West Wales. And we have a, a, an Asian pear, Shinseki. Beautiful, beautiful tree. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite trees actually. I, I, I do love them and beautiful blossom, but they they come into blossom really early. So it's second year in a row, well, third year in a row, I think, that it's, we've had, we had late frosts I didn't protect the tree with any, um, with any, with anything, with any covering, and we lost all the blossom. No Asian pears yet again. So, if you're protecting from the wind, and you can, it then helps if there is the late frost that you can actually ameliorate the the, the damage that a late frost will do. So it, it helps in so many different ways. And I must point out, I don't know if anyone here watches uh, Gardener's World, um, but the the oh what's her name who goes she's got a there's a woman um has got a, a allotment on the in in Kent, and it's desolate. <laughs> I get every time I see that particular episode and she's out she's out in her allotment and looks and it's you know it's great it's it's really good, but I just think plant a windbreak please somebody plant a windbreak and just stop this howling wind from coming in. So uh, protection. So we're just going to look at. Um, windbreak hedges first of all this is a uh, rosa rugosa at martin crawford's what well, is his second site that he's got over and out down in devon um makes a makes a good hedge about two 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 three meters high uh two meters wide a bit straggly and will flop over doesn't like too much exposure um 
but they do take a time. It's you've got to work out the right hedge for the you've got to work out the right hedge for the right place, the right the right plant for the right place, and uh, they take a while to get established. I mean, we've got some we've got Rosa Rugosa up and up in the forest garden at the top, and it's it's taken about four years for it to get to to two and a half meters tall. So in the meantime, this is what I'm such a big, big uh, proponent of is a dead hedge, and I love you know I love dead hedges um, because they're just they're just great. First of all, it's it's a fantastic temporary protection from the wind. You're protecting a particular a particular plant. Behind here is a Yushania anseps. It's a, a, a an edible bamboo, and it's getting battered by the wind. So I've built my first dead hedge. Uh, and it uses up uh, lots of uh, prunings and uh, what's called brash, like the lower branches from, from prunings and trees and stuff. And it's really, really simple to make. And it can be elegant. I do want to show you this, actually. I, I shouldn't... Uh... There's a chap called John Little, who I think I mentioned last week. Uh, and I saw his... Oh, it's not going to let me do it. Hold on. <laughs> I'll put it over there. Um, I saw his... He had a little video he does little videos uh, and they're you know really really interesting because it's it's looking at the aesthetic side of wildlife gardening and i think there is just so many possibilities that it's not one or the other you can have both you can do everything so compare <laughs> compare and contrast this is john's uh, rather delightful um dead hedge in the garden and it's very artfully done and it weavily weaving through the through the trees and then you've got my <laughs> scratty old scratty old dead hedge there so you can make them look beautiful you know this is reminds me of the uh, landscape artist um andy goldsworthy andy goldsworthy i think it is andy goldsworthy yeah and oh there's another chap as well anyway so there's lots of things that you can do with your materials you they don't have to be plonked in a pile so um yeah really yeah really really oh, just really really exciting i just think it's great that you have all this stuff that you that the possibilities that you've got that they're, 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 they're infinite they're just it's just it's just great um so not only so not only uh, can you make them look aesthetically pleasing you you, you can they're the fantastic wildlife habitat too and what i have found which is particularly good is that if you, we've got a load, load of bramble, uh, I think bramble is one of the most successful <laughs> successful um, plants for what they call it pioneer pioneer species. And we get a load of bramble and constantly kind of got bramble cuttings where we're cutting it back. And and they used to have bonfires every every few months, a big pile of bramble and sticks and stuff. But now I put the bramble onto the dead hedge. Brilliant! You put, stack it on the dead hedge, stack it on the top if you're worried about it root. Um, rooting but it generally doesn't it just dries out and it's a great way of using up bramble and thorny stuff and it's so you don't have to don't have to burn it so that that's great now what i did notice as well in that excuse me is that um mike crawford he's he, 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 i remember going around his his forest garden and he uh, had a lot of the brash a lot of the branches he'll just leave and leave in a pile on the floor which is again that's great wildlife habitat but this uh, a dead hedge is kind of combination of both so not everyone's going to need a dead hedge and not everyone's going to need you might already have established wind breaks and you, you might not need to do them but i do i do love them i think they are, they are fantastic another thing that you can plant is a nurse tree and a nurse tree is a uh, small relatively small short-lived tree that provides protection for a particular for a particular plant uh, for a few years until that plant gets established and what I've used, I've actually used cornice because it's so easy to propagate. You can just stick a cornice, uh, dogwood, red dogwood or yellow dogwood cutting into the ground uh, a couple of metres away from the tree. And cornice is actually really quick to establish, which is why I've, I've, I've used it in a few places. But a really good one is uh, broom, um, Cytisis scaparius. Cytisis scaparius, I don't know how you pronounce it. And broom is great because it's short-lived, uh, it's nitrogen-fixing, uh, it needs full sun, so it will naturally die back when the when the when the tree which is being shielded gets gets bigger, uh, and yeah, it's 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 great. Uh, so nurse trees totally totally recommend them. Two or three nurse trees uh, a couple of meters away from the tree that you're protecting. And of course, I didn't think about this. I didn't think about this at all. But a polytunnel, 
is protection from the wind. You normally think of a, I normally thought, I thought of a polytunnel as a place for warm, as a warm place for tomatoes and chilies and the like. But it's as much a, a place for protecting from the wind and the kind of chilling effects of the wind too, as I mentioned earlier about the Asian pear. Uh, so what I've actually started doing is putting more kind of slightly, we're, we're, we're warm here, it goes down to about minus five, minus 10, which, um, oh, there's a new RHS, I didn't know about this until a, a little while ago. There's a new RHS hardiness uh, setting. So <clears throat> the, the traditional hardiness, uh, how cold an area gets is, is the United States, USDA, United States, oh, I don't know what it stands for, USDA hardiness, and it's, it's more continental climate, so much hotter summers, much colder winters, whereas in the UK, we're a, much, we're a kind of cool temperate climate, uh, so the, 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 the ranges are much, they're much uh, smaller. <laughs> so R, the RHS has made an RHS hardness. So what this means in a polytunnel is that you can use plants, even though the temperatures will go down significantly in a polytunnel because there's no insulation and I don't have a heat pump in there. It does mean you can grow a much wider range of plants if you're using it. So for example, we have in this picture here, a uh, grapevine, this is a, um, an edible and a wine grape, can't remember the, 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 the cultivar name. And also down at the bottom, I've just planted two Chilean guava, which is Queen Victoria's favorite fruit. Um, one was a present from a friend actually. And so they grow to about two meters tall, meter or so wide, and they'll, they're at the top, the, the north end of the polytunnel, so they won't block out much light. Uh, and they're, but they are a little bit on the tender side. I had one out in the forest garden that died a few years ago. And then un underneath, uh, I have a, a, some uh, normal, ordinary strawberries, like kind of fruit bearing strawberries. So that'll be a strawberry bed, and then it'll be chili and guava and, and gooseberries. And there's some squash there, but just for this year, there'll be some squash. You won't have them next year. Uh, so polytunnel, great protection from the wind. So the cold, um, yes. As I was saying, the uh, cold, the, the, the kind of key thing about a, a polytunnel is that it heats up a hell of a lot quicker than because you're getting a lot of solar gain. There's no movement from the wind, so the temperature, you can get much, much hotter temperatures and it concentrates the sun, which is, which is great actually. Uh, unless you're growing, you're, you're growing a lot of stuff from seed. So do be aware that you need some shade. If you're growing really young plants, they won't, a lot of very small young plants will dry out quickly and they'll need protecting from extreme heat. Um, so you might think about, about putting some shade in there, which is where the potting shed and, and a, a kind of greenhouse comes in. So yeah, polytunnel is great for, in the summer, it's great for crops that, uh, annual crops that like full sun or kind of half hardy crops or half hardy perennials that I'm starting to put in. But do be aware that you will need to kind of put your, your, your younger plants elsewhere and, and that watering does become, does become an issue really. And a polytunnel is much cheaper than a greenhouse. And what I would say, if you're considering a polytunnel, uh, we've got ours on a slope, as you can see here. We've got the biggest one that we could afford, so it is pretty, it is pretty giant. But um, get the biggest one you can afford, the best quality that you can afford, because they will last for years. But you can just see there's a door, there's a human door. So rather than have these big double, these big barn doors that open up, so you've got to have them open or shut. And if you have them shut, it gets, it can get really, really hot too quickly. Uh, what you can have is a human door to keep out like rabbits and, and, and other, 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 other animals and dogs and stuff. And then you have um, a window that folds down. So here is a, is a, is a window that folds down. And that's, a bit, that's much more flexible. So you can open and shut the window and open and shut the door. So much, much more flexible. So totally recommend getting that. And if you can, oh yeah, always orient, right, if you possibly can, orient it north to south because you're gonna get much more sun uh, when the sun rises. Oh, it's hard to describe when the sun rises you're getting more even sun across the crops as the sun goes through the sky than if you have it that way round you're going to have it's going to be much less even on the crops so north to south orientation is best for a polytunnel and a greenhouse and flat if you've got flat land it is it is much better to get it to keep the to keep the land flat we've got ours on a slope because that's actually the only place that we could have it uh 
and you'd be surprised at how many times you can fall over in a pony tunnel. <laughs> I mean, you do get used to it, but one leg, one of my legs is slightly longer than the other leg, rather like a mountain goat as I go around the mountain. Um, so, uh, yes, and then greenhouse. That's a fantastic image of a, of a grapevine in the greenhouse I got off of uh, Flickr. Um, the yeah so greenhouse I love greenhouses as well there's something about a greenhouse I think it's because my mum had them um, my parents had them when, when we were kids and they are kind of much more they're much more expensive to set up um, but they are, they, are, they are brilliant but um, you can actually heat them as well and there's Martin Crawford has got a course which I'll just copy the link into the chat he's got a forest garden greenhouse course uh, using a, a natural kind of natural heat pump, there is a book that he re recommends, the Forest Garden Greenhouse. I can, <clears throat> and I have read this book, um, and it is good. Um, that what he's called, he calls it a climate battery. Uh, it's very clever, and it's what Martin Crawford's got on his site down in Devon, where he's got a massive, great big, uh, ex commercial greenhouse, uh, and it's, it's it's fantastic, and that's where the courses run, and. There is a um, in in the in the daytime the 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 air heats up and the air is sucked under the ground and warms the ground up and comes back up uh, at night time when the temperature drops the air uh, the air the warm air comes out of the out of the pipe in the ground so you kind of got a circulation it's a it's using the earth as a climate battery I absolutely love the idea I haven't really haven't really had the opportunity to put it into practice. No, we are actually, yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be a really interesting project to do. So, yeah, I think it's good. I, yeah, I think you need to have, you need to have the, uh, you need to have the, you need to have it in place. You need to have a good reason to use it. But it is worth a read. I do, I, I really would recommend having a look at that. So that's in the chat as well. Um, yeah, and then potting shed. It's, um, I love potting sheds too. Uh, it's a bit of a luxury. I think if if you've got a large forest garden or you do a lot of forest gardens, I dream of having a potting shed, uh, somewhere to sit down and have a cup of tea, and and it's just yeah, it's just brilliant, just a brilliant, brilliant place. And it's also a place where you can. Uh, what I would use it for is to have a bit of shade with it, so that the plants you can have younger plants in there, so you kind of grow. You you'd have a. a I've got a. I built a, a propagation bed. That's the point. I didn't put that down. I must put down the propagation bed. I add a propagation bed, like a made out of a heating element with in a in a load of sand. Propagation bed, and what you um, what I'm going to do is with a potting shed because I do a lot of. I will be doing a lot more gardens for other people and then growing plants for other people as well. So it's it's worth my while to do this. But there'll be a I'll, I'll make a potting shed with a bit of shade in it so the seeds can get uh, enough warmth and just enough light for them to grow uh, but it's not the full-on glare that you'd get in a polytunnel or a greenhouse and then you can move it out into uh, a greenhouse or into a, into a cold frame so yeah it's a kind of transitional space starting stuff off like a propagation propagation shed really and then putting them out when they get little, when they get big enough um so that's what i'm really looking forward to looking forward to using it for um but yeah they are a bit a bit of a luxury but if you do have a large garden or medium sized to large garden totally totally recommend propagating getting a propagating area anyway because you, it's so much cheaper uh, for particularly for like ground cover plants if you need like three to five ground cover plants per square meter even in 20 square meters that's that's the that's a fair old uh, number of plants i would do the maths but <laughs> but i'm not going to um and the cold frame and yeah, oh the cold frame potting shed oh i haven't got a picture of a cold frame Ugh. anyway cold frames I, I i must admit i've been very lax on the cold frame front but i i'm gonna I, I, I need to make some because they are like a, a a transitional space. Again, if you've got a warm space, you're doing seeds. You put you got seedlings. You don't want to put them straight out into a polytunnel. You want to have them or straight outside. Uh, you need to put them out in somewhere in between. So depending upon the stage of the plant, it's a really really good space to put your 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 plants to what's called harden them off. 
you you get them accustomed to being outside but you they get a bit of warmth from the glass so a cold frame is essentially it's like a, a miniature it's like a miniature greenhouse with a roof that you can lift up to cool it down but it provides protection from the wind and get, you get a bit of solar gain from it as well so totally totally recommend um cold frames i'm going to try and make probably make my own one i'm not too sure to so see how it goes but uh yeah must um must do that add it to the list of things to do so this is kind of protecting from cold and then water now it's a funny one I, I, i'm two minds about whether to include this and then thinking yes because water is such an integral part of a garden and big conversation with pam about this and talking about the use of the use of swales and um, a swale is like a ditch that for, is, is a ditch that slows down the process the progress of the water keeps the water on the land for longer and, and so, the, so you don't get runoff particularly if the land is steep um, and I was thinking I'd never use would never need to use um, I'd never need to use swales in in West Wales but we had two month drought and yeah I'm thinking that that it, they they definitely 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 do think about creating a water retaining features such as swales so there's the lack of water and there's, and there's also um, too much water as well but in, from a design point of view um, you, you're kind of protecting your plants it's, it's not really protection as such but you want to have the taps and the hose near to the propagation area where you've got young plants then you really it's a really good idea to have a tap taps and a hose and I'd also go so far as to say there's certain certain plants as well which would benefit from, you know, would benefit from from watering. So it's handy to have a hose near them. Uh, case in point here is we've got a raspberry patch of um, early raspberries. It's a bit wild and out of control, but they really really suffered in the drought that we had for two months. So we've had a very poor raspberry harvest, and it's and it's a bit ridiculous because it's only a short. Um, it's only a short walk. It's about about ten ten yards away from from where a hose is. So what I'm doing is to build a path to take the hose up, and then next year if we have a dry spell, I can always just boost the raspberries a little bit, give them a little bit of a helping hand to make sure the fruit sets properly. Um, so yes, there is there is that as well. There is like yeah, keeping a there's some plants which are kind of borderline, um, and yeah, get a decent hose if you're going to get yeah the hose is to get a decent hose don't don't get a if you can afford a decent hose get one because there's nothing worse than a crap hose that keeps kinking uh and then paths and this is kind of essential for for access uh this is a a picture uh, this, this is a photograph of the a, a kind of remade grass path i re reduce the amount of grass paths you, you can to get them as narrow as you can because it means less mowing and less kind of maintenance for the path um, but have them so you know this is going around the, the what is now the annual veg bed but it's gradually being transitioned to perennial veg um, it enables access for it enables access for watering and you can just about see i've got a stick in the corner of the corner of the raised bed so you go down the path and, the, and then the stick stops the, the the hose going across the going across the raised beds uh, but they're really really yeah really really essential to be able to access for watering and for attention so pars totally totally crucial i uh, thinking about where they go and then harvesting rainwater uh if, yeah if you possibly can harvest rainwater we're very lucky here we've got a well that we've had a pump fitted into and that's what we use for the for the polytunnel and then swales and mounds um i'm i don't know much about them to be perfectly frank i never thought i'd be using them as I, as i mentioned before this is a project in mexico i need to add add notes this is a project uh, a permaculture project in mexico and they're very very heavy clay soil but very dry as well but when it does rain they wanted the water to stay but they didn't want it to swamp the trees so they put i don't know if you can see that but they put the, planted the trees in mounds with its own little swale around it so yeah it's a really nice idea you have, if you've got too much water there's a nursery just up the road actually a really good nursery t ross trees and they've planted their apple trees in a damp spot. They put the apple trees on a mound just to kind of raise it up enough so that they don't get swamped by the water. Uh, 
and that's just like a really a really good trick if it's too damp and if it's too dry then you've got a, a, a swale um, a little ditch to, uh, an irrigation ditch around it as well and then predators I'll just whiz through these slugs <laughs> um, yeah slugs we, that I went uh, yes slugs not so much of a problem with perennials once perennials are established and what I will be covering in the next the next lecture is perennial vegetables but reduce reduce the habitat by weeding which sounds kind of a, if you've got young plants young perennial vegetables will get eaten by slugs just as much as young annual vegetables will and it's the young stage generally it's a young stage of a plant that is it's most the, the the most vulnerable so what i do is to treat perennial vegetables as if they're annual vegetables until they're mature enough to look after themselves so what that means in practice is i've got uh, let's see i've got a, a perennial kale portuguese kale and i'm just keeping it weeded around the area around the around the kale uh, i'll have a compost mulch over the top of it and it treat it like an annual annual cabbage and it's worked there's not there's not been okay it's been quite dry but there's not been the slug damage on it that i would have expected um because we do have an awful lot of slugs here in west wales and yeah you you, you keep the area weeded and keep it clear until it's old enough to look after itself and then the surrounding area is um oh what's it called ground ivy uh which grows really well here and that will i'll let that come in i'll let that come in and cover the area later on when the kale is big enough and ground ivy is actually a really nice plant. I hadn't thought about this. This is something that occurred to me the other day. Uh, Glycoma hederacea. And it's great because it's got a very shallow root system. Uh, it's quite pervasive, so you can kind of overrun things. So you've got to be a bit aware of it. But you can pull it back really, really easily. I've planted um, a gooseberry, Hino green, into a patch of uh, ground ivy. And I've just, yesterday, just pulled the ground ivy back. Uh, to let to let the um, to let the gooseberry get established, and it's very you know it's very manageable. I, I like it. Uh, mice, oh yes. Um, best thing with mice is well, we get quite a lot of mice damage in two different ways. Firstly, they eat a lot. Certain plants they'll eat in the polytunnel. Certain young plants they love lupins. Here, I don't know why they've eaten all the lupins. We've got one <laughs> lupin surviving out of out of a dozen of them. Uh, and the best way to, to, to avoid damage is to raise them off the ground. If you've got any kind of hanging suspension sort of any way of hanging plants on a, on a, on a board, that's, that's a great way of doing it or propping them up off, off the ground on bricks or something. But yeah, get them off the ground, get them out of the way of the, the mice. If they're on the ground, they'll, they'll go straight, straight for them. So on shelves or something would be, would be useful. And uh, then the other problem, the other thing you've got to look out for with mice is we had a lot of sheet mulch down I'm trying to move away from using plastic sheet mulch, um, but I'll talk about that in the ground preparation lecture. Uh, and we put a lot of sheet mulch down, and the um, the mice were making make loads of homes, a lot of burrows underneath the sheet mulch. And unfortunately, there is a tree, and its roots were eaten by the mice. I don't think they're actually properly probably even eating the the roots. They've just made their home there, and they're burrowing around the tree, and that that particular tree's died. So yeah, do be careful of that. Um, be careful of the mulch. If you're going to use a mulch around a, around a fruit tree, use a kind of heavy mulch like um, like wood chip or something or or or, or bark. Uh, squirrels, well, yeah, squirrels are a problem with nut trees, and protecting nut trees is uh, oh problematic um, from squirrels. The sweet chestnuts you don't really have to protect because they have a Normally they have, they have a prickly outside which deters the squirrels and they fall to the ground when they're ready and that's only then normally then when they open so you've got to be quick to go and harvest the sweet chestnuts but other nuts like hazelnuts and walnuts and heart nuts and the rest of it the squirrels will <laughs> squirrels will come and if anybody knows a good way of uh, yeah we haven't we're not at the stage of harvesting nuts yet but if anybody knows of a good way of controlling squirrels without killing them uh, because uh, we're we're kind of we're kind of vegan. We're going vegan, um, so yes, uh, <laughs> squirrels. Mm. Um, the, the other ideas are to isolate the fruit, isolate the nut trees, so they're not close to the canopy of any other established trees, and to kind of have them in isolation with a, an air, a, a, an area blank area around around them. But I think in a forest garden that's going to be kind of hard. But that's 
work things to think about for the future and then birds um, and you'll notice that uh, I've used the same the same picture here so for uh, the beginning of this of the protection side there's the at the beginning of it there's the birds pro providing protection for wildlife but also protecting your crop from wildlife and it's a balance and this is the key point it is a balance you've got to meet them in the middle you can't have one without the other uh, it, it kind of doesn't work like that so protecting your crop from birds do you sacrifice some of your crop do you net the tree like cherries i yeah i've kind of given up on the cherry crop this year i planted the cherries too far away from the house so i haven't been up to see the cherry tree the cherries are all gone but there's a chap i know up the road uh, who who nets his cherry trees and, and gets out there early so yeah okay let's zoom on to design all right then designing windbreaks um yeah i would like to i will yeah i'll i'll incorporate some of the other ideas back into the design lecture earlier on i think but here we're just going to be talking about designing windbreaks um so what you're doing is the height of a windbreak gives a protection uh so the higher windbreak is the more protection it gives the aspect dictates a height and that means that depends whereabouts in the garden like the orientation of the garden where the where the south is where west is and where east is and north where the points of the garden are where the points of the compass are determines how much light comes in and that's the critical part is that you want you don't want to shade stuff out but you do want to give protection so it's yeah it's like it's a again it's a balancing act and then we we'll look at profile the profile of the uh, the profile of the, the windbreak if it's a sloping windbreak or whether it's an upright windbreak and the kind of multifunction aspect of a windbreak as well a key thing i'll say here is plant hedges for the final size yeah always be aware of how big the hedge will eventually grow to and plant for that always plant i think pretty much all plants in the forest garden plant them for the final size so yeah height for protection um, the height this is a simple formula really easy to remember the height protects for eight times the length and what that means is if you have a two meter high hedge it will protect for uh, 16 meters yeah so if you have a 32 meter wide garden you'll want a four meter high windbreak alternatively you can have um, two windbreaks to extend that protection for 32 meters yeah so you can have two two meter windbreaks or one four meter windbreak and that's how far the, ex the protection will extend for so saying so aspect dictates a height take into account that you can have taller hedges on the north and the east uh, because the the north side of your your your, your property you'll get less light so you can have a t you can have a taller windbreak hedge uh the east the the this the, the warmth the sun that you get from the east is generally less valuable than the sun that you get from the west because the air has had a time to warm up throughout the day and you get more better photosynthesis in the afternoon than you do in the morning so west sunlight is generally more valuable and calculate the sun sunlight calculate the position of the sun there's a fantastic app i, I kind of recommend called sun surveyor which you can get for android and for um, ios uh, and it will tell you the position of the sun in the during the day but also throughout the year and it's fantastic for being able to work out how much light um, a particular hedge will block off so you can estimate where the hedge will be and you can figure out how where the shade will fall and that you can do that for throughout the year as well and finally check the prevailing wind uh, this is yeah this is a, an image from meteo.com m-e-t-e-o.com but they'll they'll do you can get an, an idea of where the prevailing wind is for your property as well because obviously the prevailing wind is the area that you that is is the direction that you really want to protect from so here we get prevailing wind is southwesterly westerly and in the summer and th mostly throughout the year and then we'll get northeast to these uh, in the winter uh, profile and gaps okay so 
Vertical, apparently, um, according to Martin Crawford, a vertical profile is better for protection than a sloping profile. So you want to have, like, a, if you can, a vertical profile um, like that. Kudunk, and the wind comes in and goes up and over rather than the sloping profile that sneaks in. But you've got to think also think about how your garden fits into the landscape as to what profile you have and watch out for frost pockets with any windbreak hedge um any hedge at all you've got to make sure that you're that if you if you have a frost pocket if you have an area where the frost will come down the hill and you've got a windbreak hedge then it will the cold air will collect and that will be a much much colder area so you can what you can do is to put your hedge on a slant and then that way the the frost will roll down the edge of the hedge yeah so yeah do watch out for frost pockets on slopes um there's ways of dealing with gaps in hedges so you can have a gap in the hedge if you've got as soon as you've got a gap in the hedge the wind will go straight through and um, yeah it will be quite damaging it'll actually speed up in that gap as well so what you can have is a baffle um or an island gap so i've done this a few times here you have a, an extra hedge behind so you can go in to, in through the entrance and then around it uh, a staggered gap whether there's a gap and you have to go around that way and then an angle gap as well it depends on your situation and stack those functions make sure um <laughs> sorry okay uh do bear in mind that the plants that you're choosing will the hedgerows that you're choosing will uh be the hedgerows that you're choosing will have multiple functions, as I mentioned earlier on. So really, a windbreak hedge is about primarily is about creating a microclimate, but also it's providing uh, wildlife food and shelter. So think about using native plants for a wild, for, for a head. Think about using native plants for for a windbreak, and think about the crops. You can also get a crop from them if they are on the outside border, then uh, of facing the wind, then you'll get less crops uh, if it's more exposed. But you still might well get a, a decent crop. And think about nitrogen fixing too. So stack those functions in par permaculture parlance. Um, key, okay, key design. Yeah. So key design takeaways: plant hedges for the final size. That's what I'll say. Always plant for the final size. Okay. I get better move on. Oh blimey! Yeah, I better get a quick move on because I'm going to be late for Zoom. Um, mulching, establishing a hedge. So really, really important that you est that you mulch that you keep the grass down or whatever the whatever the ground cover is that you've got there already keep it down mulch it however you whatever way that you've got here we've got a lot of grass and we've been using um two sheets of mulch sheet mulch and put them together like that and that way they're much more reusable rather than planting through a sheet mulch you you, you put two bits together and then plant in the gap and then put a mulch over uh, a wood chip mulch over the top uh, and that way, <clears throat> you'll keep. We we kind of didn't have to remove the grass or anything. We've been able to plant into the gap, um, and you plant bare root is so so much cheaper uh, than buying buying plants in pots. And you buy bare root from uh, November through to March, and a, and a windbreak hedge will cost about be around about one pound per plant, uh, which you think is quite good. But then if you do, you know, you've got a fair sized garden then you're going to have like a hundred plants or yeah a hundred you're planting every half a meter that's going to be a hundred plants for a 50 meter for a 50 meter hedge and then if you're having a double hedge which i always actually always recommend if you've got the space you're much better to have a double hedge so plant oh, I, I should do a double hedge add a double hedge that you'd be much better with a double hedge because you're going to get more protection, um, particularly if it's a deciduous hedge. So you plant in. Oh, I should be able. To, you've got you've got one row like that, and then you just alternate on the other row. So you have. <laughs> I can't do it. So you've got um a, the, the second row here, and then plant this way. So you've got a zigzag of windbreak plants, and plant at the winter time. Um, yep, obviously that's when you're getting the bare root plants in. And this is your friend, a tree spade. Uh, fantastic, this is Spear and Jackson. But uh, this is my one of my most used tools in the forest garden. It's absolutely brilliant, use it for loads of things. Right, quickly, quickly, um, I'm very aware, I've just gone on and on and on. Uh, plants, uh, I'm 
a lot of the stuff here I'm talk about the plants I talk about are UK focused because uh, that's where I'm based. Native where possible, wherever you are in the world, grow native species where possible, and you you can have a mixture. What's so nice about a forest garden is that there is room for diversity. Uh, consider the sun, the soil. Be aware of invasive plants. So, and what is invasive really does depend upon where you are. For example. Uh, autumn olive, Eliagnus umbellata, really nice windbreak hedge plant, uh, comes from China, grows to five metres tall, four metres wide, nitrogen fixing, uh, b amazing flowers for pollinators, edible berries, so really good all round plant. Um, isn't invasive really, no kind of, no notes of it being invasive in Europe, as far as I know, but it is invasive in certain parts of the the, the US, so be be careful, be aware of invasive plants and it, what's invasive depends upon where you are in the world. Plants for Future website is a great, great resource. Uh, do check that out. And they do have a section. Oh, I'll pop this into the into the, the chat actually. So I've kind of gone off though. Plants for Future website, a fantastic list. Really, really good resource. Decidu whether it's deciduous, the height, the hardiness and all the rest of UK native plants. Uh, these are the four plants I kind of really, really like. Uh, uh, European Barberry, haven't really used this yet as a windbreak, um, but it's deciduous, UK native, really good for wildlife, and it does have edible berries as well, uh, very spiny. Um, I've got what we've got a couple on the on the on the land that are, and they smell gorgeous actually, um, kind of uh, early late spring, early summer, really really nice, love them. Um, we'll we'll be trying them more. Gelderose, well actually I love this as well, fantastic plant, very easy to propagate. Um, glorious fruit I mean they're kind of supposed to be almost edible there is an, a, 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 North, a North American species which is um, these are Viburnum opulus and there's one which is Viburnum ugh, can't remember there's a, it's another one it's closely related apparently the berries are more uh, are more edible than the Gelda Rose which is worth checking out five meters by five meters lovely lovely plant beautiful blossom as well absolutely beautiful uh, sea buckthorn and UK native, UK native again. This is uh, this is fantastic. This is oh yeah, this is absolutely brilliant. The um, it's it can be it, it suckers, so do watch out. Can be invasive in certain areas, even like in the UK. The the colleges go no, don't plant, don't plant seed buckthorn. It's 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 a thug. But well, yeah. And there's the database of insects and their plant. Oh good lord. Database of insects and their food plants, DBIF, and this is the list of invertebrates that use um, that use the uh, the sea buckthorn as a as a host plant. Really good resource. That the, the links are in here. Uh, database of insects and their food plants, and then the hawthorn. Hawthorns are brilliant. I absolutely love hawthorns. Native. They, I think we've got two native hawthorns. Critigus monogena. And there's another one, which is, can't remember off the top of my head, Midland Hawthorn. Pretty big, kind of tall. Um, yeah, but they're great. Um, awesome for wildlife, habitat, spiny, berries, flowers. Oh, they're just, they're just great. Uh, North American species do have bigger haws. Martin Crawford, and I can't remember whether it's, I think it's in the trees one, in his um, trees for, oh God, I can't see myself. Oh, that one. He's got a load more information about hawthorns in here. So if you're interested in hawthorns, that's that's it's worth getting. Um, I'd love to have the national collection of hawthorns just because it'd be great to have a national collection of hawthorns. And then I found out there's like 200 species or something. There's a vast, vast number. So that well, that means we'll have to buy a few acres to have the national collection of hawthorns. Maybe you'll park that idea. Um, so yeah, they're, they're absolutely great. Love, love. Um, hawthorns do check them out and there's lots of different sizes as well for the North American varieties and you can also make a, a family tree a family tree is a name for traditionally an apple tree where you have one rootstock and then you can have multiple um, oh, grafts of different different cultivars on that on that rootstock so yeah it's just you can do the same thing with a hawthorn so you can actually have a hawthorn most of the hawthorn that you buy in the UK are native hawthorn rootstock and then they have grafted on the North American um, species 
and you could actually have an, a, a combination one, which would be a really interesting project if only I had more time. Um, other ones are recommended, Autumn Olive, I'll just quickly go through these. Autumn Olive, fantastic, four meters, five, five meters by four meters. Great for pollinators, nitrogen fixing, edible fruit, forest garden, classic plant. Futureforest.ie is really, really good. If you get named varieties, if you possibly can. Oh, there we go. Um, get named varieties if you possibly can. Um, okay. Name varieties because, and then propagate your own because you're going to get a much better cro fruit crop. If you if you're just interested in it purely as a windbreak hedge, for, oh, what the future forest? I got some from Future Forest, and they're really good. Futureforest.ie for autumn olive. Um, cool. And then the next one, a close relation, Eliagnus exabingii, uh, Ebbing silverberry apparently is its proper name. Uh, really lovely uh, flowers and very and, and scented as well and edible fruit. Uh, quite slow growing. They're evergreen, so they're more expensive. You will notice these a lot in in car parks because they're they provide a lot of protection. They're uh, yeah. I should I should grow some more and try some more out. They're actually really really nice plant. Juneberry, Amelanchia canadensis, a uh, beautiful plant. Again, you can get cultivars. This is a this this is a, this is a species that you normally get for hedging. You can get cultivars with more edible fruit. The fruit on this one is not very good, and you get berries in June, <laughs> hence the name. And uh, it goes really well with Gelder Rose. Uh, dogwood. This is a lovely one. Oh, that's a good point actually. Sorry, someone's just asked in the chat. Um, let me see if I can do this, Julie. Uh, uh, for a two meter, there we go. Oops, hold on. So if someone's asked in the chat for a two meter high, um, <laughs> two meter high windbreak plant, and I would say uh, this is great. This is really really good. Is a is a red dogwood uh, because they're so. They're so easy to kind of control. They're just like really, they're, they're easy to propagate and they're easy to cut back to and they, they come back really readily. Uh, I think it's naturalized native. I'm not sure if it's a native native. Mm, no, I don't know, don't know. There's some question marks over Cornus. I'd like to find out more about Cornus actually, do like them. Darwin's Barbary, Evergreen Barbary, goes to three meters high, three and a half meters wide. So Evergreen's really good if you've got a wildlife pond, kind of use Evergreen's around a pond. Uh, so there's no leaf drop into the pond and that means less cleaning for you. Edible berries and spiny and apparently Korean barberry, final one. This is a best, one of the best tasting one. Uh, again, Martin Crawford, I think it's in his shrubs book actually. I think he's under a shrub. Is it? I think he's under the shrub. Martin Crawford can't see myself again. Martin Crawford recommends it in this book. He says it's oh the most edible of the, bar of the barberries. So um, I haven't got one. I will get one. <laughs> One day, and then finally, propagation. Propagation uh, is, is is great. So, if you're going to buy them, buy bare root. Uh, but if you're going to, if you've got, if you, if you've got the time, propagate from named varieties, named cultivars, uh, which means you'll get a much better fruit crop, and it's cheap and easy to do as well. Uh, I haven't got a propagation lecture. Oh, good lord! I haven't got a propagation lecture anymore. So. Um, um, but I would say is do look at propagating if you've got the time look at propagating your own windbreak hedges Martin Crawford's got a whole autumn olive windbreak hedge down in down in Devon and that's like really nice fruiting um, fruiting cultivars okay yeah and here this photograph this is corners this is the hedge that i created going oh my goodness me isn't it windy let's get some more hedge let's get some more hedges in and this is a uh, red dogwood and i just literally put the sticks in the ground in 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 winter winter time and pretty much every single one of those has taken and i'd kind of mulch them with a bit of grass and grass cuttings or whatever's kicking around so yeah much much cheaper that would have cost me about 60 quid if I bought it from the local, 100 quid or so if I bought it from the local nursery. <clears throat> so backyard forest takeaways. Windbreaks are the priority. Get the windbreaks in 
uh, use temporary windbreaks if you have if, if you need to so dead hedges and nurse trees and always always plant for the final width and height yeah and uh, that is it so um, I hope I hope that was exciting and interesting really sorry gone right over I shall see you over in zoom in a second thank you very much for watching and see you soon okay bye